Do you want to build with an easy, safe, and fast playstyle? It's completely unaffected by curses, a 7,000 effective health pool, ridiculous regen, I'm talking a thousand or more per second, and all of that funded by a bunch of cheap uniques and some random rare pieces? This is Divine Iron Totems. Hey guys, Big Ducks here, welcome back to the channel. Now, I know what you're thinking. A totem build, really? You're gonna have me play a totem build? That's one of the most boring things that I can ever imagine. Well, Divine Iron Totems might be the most fun, maybe the only fun totem build in existence. Now, I'm right there with you. Totems really aren't my playstyle normally, but this build, honestly, is more fun than self-cast Divine Iron. Yep, I said that right. And remember guys, if you enjoy my content and you want to help me out, like this video so that more people can see it. And also, consider subscribing if you're new, or if for some reason you just haven't subscribed to my channel yet, for more content similar to this. Now, without further ado, let's take a look at a couple of the things that we did, and then we'll get into the guide. Fight Shaper for who's the better Beam Master? I think it's me. I think I'm the better Beam Master, but that's what this whole uh, this whole fight's gonna be about, boys. I think I'll win. Are we gonna get the four worst ones again? Is that what we're gonna get? Shaper's beam is bigger. Yeah, but I got more of them. Not about the size of the beam, it's how you use it, okay? Everything else, we don't really die to any one thing, right? Like, if we took three balls to the face, we'd probably die. But I don't think one ball to the face would kill us, necessarily. I've only had <laughs> two balls in my face, Max. Oof. Giving out the deets right now. How many of these flasks have we gotten, dude? <laughs> We've gotten so many of these flasks. Like, I feel like this is like the only thing that drops for us is this fucking flask. Probably need to make that the meteor tower. No, no, I need to make these stuns. Totems for your totems? You don't need more totems, dude? Come on. Hate this bastard. Yeah, stun lock him, please. Thank you. Jesus. No. I hate you. Can you just die already, please? Yeah, see, with this being only two sides, it, it ends up becoming a lot easier to manage. Without it coming from every single direction imaginable, it, it makes it quite a bit easier to manage, which is nice. All right, come on. You guys are it. Let's go. All right, easy clap. Much, much easier. Oh, come on. You got like one tap in you. Come on, buddy. Can you can you just like, can you just give it up? Thanks, dude. That's some garbage, boy. All right, guys, so this is the Divine Ire Totems Hierophant Old Man Time. So this build is something that I was kind of convinced to do by chat. I had the idea that I kind of wanted to play this build, but I wasn't really sure that I'd want to. Notoriously, I have always badmouthed totems and I've always badmouthed mines. I still badmouth mines at this point, but totems, there might be a single totem build so far that I actually enjoy playing, and that is Divine Ire Totems. So now, Divine Ire, as you know, is just an ability that you charge up, it makes a circle around you, and then when you release it, it does a big beam of energy, right? So Divine Ire in and of itself is in my opinion, not that fun of an ability. The idea that you get to charge into this big giant Kamehameha wave is, is cool, but in actual use, it tends to be pretty bad in my opinion. You have to sit there and you have to charge and then you have to release and it's kind of hard to aim and there's just, there's just a bunch of problems with it. So with it being in totem form, it actually makes it quite a bit easier. You'll see that when we get into the map, I'll talk a little bit more about how that works, but a brief overview of the build for the people that don't want to go into the path of building section, that's later on in the video. The idea is, is that we use a trigger socketed spell wand with just some lightning spell gem levels, some lightning damage and cast speed. Cast speed's really big for the feel good of this build. We also just use random helmet with some stuff on it, just life, resistances, 
a amulet with plus one to level of all physical gems. Keep in mind, this would be better if it was plus one to all lightning gems. I'm trying to craft that one here. We've got some random gloves with physical damage converted to lightning. You can craft that. Belt with some resistances in life. Boots with some move speed, resistances in life. And then the rest of the build is the part where it gets even just a little bit more expensive. All of that gear, just some random stuff that I crafted or found or bought for almost no money. Now, the Kiki Zaros are very cheap. These are normally about one chaos. These are very important to the build, and you'll see why in a moment. This shield. This was probably, besides the six link, the most expensive piece of gear that I bought, and it was around 35 chaos, I think, for this specific one. You don't have to get one with the chaos resistance on it and the mana and all of the life and all of that. Really, the main thing that you're looking for is just some life, some block spell damage, and plus one to maximum number of totems. So those are the only things that you're really looking for. You can bring down the cost of the item by reducing the mana and the chaos resist and all that stuff off of it. I spent a little bit extra on this one. And then there is the centerpiece, which is Soul Mantle. Now, the reason why this chest piece is so important is because of a jewel that we have here. I don't know where it's at. Self-flagellation. So, an additional curse can be applied to you, and 19% increased damage per curse on you. Something interesting about this build is that you'll see if we sit here and spam curse. You're going to notice I've got about 13 curses on me right now. I don't know exactly know how many is. There we go. 13 curses on me right now. So that means that we take 13 times 19. I don't even know how much that is. 190 plus 3 times 20. It's like it's like 230% and like damage or something like that. My math is off, but... Uh, you get the idea, 230% increased damage. The idea is, is that because of these two Kikizaru rings and this node right here, which is Sanctum of Thought, that makes it so that we have 100% reduced effect of curses on us. So all of these curses that you see on us are just completely ignored. That is a huge source of damage for us. And the idea here is that this gives us a seven link spell totem. So we use it with Divine Ire. And the idea is, is that with Divine Ire on a spell totem, it feels so much better than doing it self-cast. But that's pretty much the build. Uh, you guys kind of saw that I have a Thread of Hope here. A medium Thread of Hope is super powerful here. You can get a large one and grab Ancestral Bond and Glancing Blows, but being able to get Sanctum of Thought, Divine Judgment, Divine Wrath, Arcane Capacitor, and to move out a couple points somewhere around here is a huge boon. It saves you a ton of points. So the idea behind this build is it is a Hierophant, we stack a whole bunch of mana, and we have a whole bunch of damage taken as mana before life. Now, you're probably noticing that I've only got about 3,800 health, no big deal. Our actual health pool is closer to 6k. 40% of this health pool is taken as damage from mana. So the more that you stack up your health, the more you'll be able to take out of mana. We also use Arcane Cloak. This gives us a ton of extra damage prevention, because when we use this Arcane Cloak, you can see we get an extra 1500 damage shield. It also grants us a bunch of lightning damage. So the build just kind of synergizes in with itself pretty well. So we are going to be doing a pretty buffed up tier 16 Phantasmagoria map. You're going to see this has 40% monster elemental resistances on it. So keep in mind, there is a ton of mods on this. The unique boss is going to deal more damage. We've got 40% elemental resist. We're doing a Shaper Scarab as well as some fragments. We also do have four sextants on this map. So you've got additional monsters, additional monsters, additional monsters, additional monsters. We're going to run this with all this stuff in here. We are going to run a infused nemesis on it. We're also going to be running it as a Zana mod. So we've got a ton of stuff going on here. We're going to do infused nemesis. This is going to add in a bunch of extra rare monsters as well as giving them all nemesis mods. It's going to be a really, really high tier, tier 16 map. The big thing about this build, it feels better than normal Divine Ire totems, or rather normal Divine Ire. The totems themselves, as you can see as I'm spamming casting these, you notice how it's just constantly spamming two Divine Ires, one after the other after the other? So this is a tier 16 map. This has got a bunch of enemy elemental resistance, so 40 ele elemental resistance on it. And you can see we're pretty much shredding all of the enemies in this map. I did not mean to go in here. How often does that happen to you guys? You click the thing and you just instantly go into the portal without you really being able to do anything about it. You can see the playstyle is really, really smooth. This is way smoother than the normal Divine Iron playstyle. You literally just drop it down and just move on. So we've got a couple extra spells here. You can use Wave of Conviction Totems for harder enemies. The cool thing about the Wave of Conviction Totems is because we have a multi-totem on them, it doesn't actually use up our totem limit. So you can cast those and they're not affected by the other totems. So you can actually have all seven of them up at the same time. And let me show you here as well. So 
Over here on the left, I'm gonna cast, these are the Wave of Conviction totems, and then these over here are the Divine Ire totems. You can see, I can just sit here and spam these totems over and over again, Wave of Conviction totems stay up. So that's a pretty cool mechanic about the build. You just drop down those Wave of Conviction totems with the multi-totem on, and they completely ignore the totem limit of your Divine Ire totem. So I'll drop some down here. You'll see them casting in between. It helps you just melt those those tough enemies a little bit more. So this build super super fun. Everything out about everything else about this build is super super powerful. But if I had to give it some points off, it would be for the single target damage. Let's see what Zana has for us here. Don't kill us, Zana, please. What Zana has for us here, nothing really special. Okay, this playstyle, one of the most fun totem playstyles I've ever played, and honestly, I really don't like totems that much. But you guys can see that although there are a couple problems with maybe some more difficult mobs, you can just let the totems cast for a little tiny bit longer, and they'll one-shot most things with a full charge. Because these Divine Ire Totems, they forcibly charge themselves all the way to 20 before releasing at 20 stacks. That's the cool thing about the Totems themselves. And as you can see, they just kind of release whenever they're done. When we get to the boss, we'll probably jump over to that right now. So we'll see you guys in a second. All right, so starting on the boss here, the thing that you're going to notice, one interesting thing about this build is that anytime you have a map with curses or a boss with curses, you actually don't need to worry about the curses at all just because you're completely immune. Honestly, if there are curses on your map, it's a buff to your damage. But you're going to kind of see that even with all these totems constantly casting like this, it still isn't the best single target damage. Now, this is an Ellie Resist T16 buffed map and this is the boss of it. So if you think that that's probably not enough single target damage for you, there's not really much that I can do about that, but we still killed it with pretty much no issue, right? I wasn't in fear of dying there a single time, and that's because the totem playstyle is pretty safe. So that was a T16 map. You can see the mods right over here if you want. All of these mods here, boss deals extra damage, monsters have crazy AOE and poison, uh, elemental resistances. We are on Awakener 8, so this is as hard as the game can get. This is a unique boss, has 24% more life, whole bunch of extra mods and everything on it. It really is a very, very solid build. Once again, four sextants, we ran a Zana map mod, we ran a whole bunch of stuff on it. Really, really good. So we're gonna jump into the path of building. Remember, there are timestamps in the description below this video. You can go down there, get to whichever spot that you need. If you have a specific question about something about the build, most likely I've answered it in the section about path of building. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so remember as always, this video that you see here may not have the most up-to-date information on the actual pace bin for the path of building. This is just where it's at at this current point in time. I do update these slowly over time if changes happen or it's a new league. So make sure that you go down in the description, you grab the most recent pace bin and look for the information in there for the most up-to-date information. As always, there is a ton of information up in the notes section here. You can check that out. It's got information about leveling, information about all kinds of stuff that you might want, you know, extra answers for. Check the notes first, but let's go over the tree. So as I showed you before, this does mainly focus around giving us a bunch of mana, a bunch of life, a bunch of block, and that's pretty much it. Elemental damage, some totem stuff. Honestly, the totem nodes aren't that great. We grab these because there's some good crit nodes, but that's about the only totem nodes I think that we take. Most of the totem nodes are pretty mediocre. Like they're mainly totem placement speed and like to spells cast by the totems are a little bit faster, but totem duration and totem placement speed really don't do anything for us. Because we are a Hierophant, we actually have a ton of totem placement speed already. The 50% increased totem placement speed is plenty for this build. You really don't need any more than that. Along with the Pursuit of Faith, which gives us an additional max totem. And then this also giving it so that skills that would summon a totem summon two totems instead. You really don't need any extra totem placement speed. So let's go over the skill tree in whole, starting with the first leveling tree from one to 35. Now, Leveling on this build can be a little bit weak if you don't go about it the right way. So you can play this as a totem build very early on if you want. I suggest that you buy the actual chest piece, which is the soul mantle here. I suggest that you buy this. If you can afford a six link one, just buy it straight out and use it leveling from 49 on as divine iron totems. It will be an absolute breeze from level 49 all the way through the game as soon as you do that. Up until then, 
I do have a couple of skills that you can use. There's some, some suggested skills in here that you can choose from. Creeping Frost is a really good option. Orb of Storms is a really good option. Those two together, or maybe even Wave of Conviction and Orb of Storms would get you through all the way up to 49, no problem. You can switch over to Totems whenever you want. When you do decide to go Totems, switch to Ancestral Bond. But my preferred method is going up to about 49 and then maybe switching over to Totems then. So the first thing that we do is we come out here through Damage and Elemental Damage. I'm gonna grab this Retribution node here, some Life, some Elemental Damage and Resistance, more life, head up towards the top here, some chaos resist and life here, and then we're going to be grabbing elemental overload. So elemental overload we take early on before we're getting totems, and then we remove this later. So, and then we grab some more life here. That's the majority of the early game is just getting over to elemental overload, grabbing a bit of damage and grabbing a bit of life. Once we get to our second portion of the tree here, we're gonna be grabbing some block nodes. These nodes are actually really, really powerful. These nodes give you a ton of spell block and some spell damage. Also, we're gonna be picking up these nodes down here, which are gonna give us more block, more elemental resistances, and a ton of defenses because of glancing blows. Glancing blows doubles the chance that you have to block spell and attack damage, but halves the effectiveness of blocking. Glancing blows is honestly a really, really good node. Now, we'll talk more about ascendancies in a moment, but when you do hit your second ascendancy level, I do suggest that you grab the agnostic. This node, along with dynamo using arcane cloak, is ridiculously powerful for leveling. All you need is a maxed clarity and nothing else, and your defenses are pretty much good for the entire time that you're leveling. I grabbed this around like level 40, I think is when I grabbed it. You can do it earlier, you can do it later, but the Agnostic plus this Dynamo node with Arcane Cloak is really, really good. Don't overlook it. That's pretty much all that we get for this little leveling section here is this section down here, as well as some more block nodes up there. Now moving on to after we've finished Katava and we have grabbed all of our skill points, this is when we're going to pick up Mind Over Matter. This is when we're going to pick up Sanctum of Thought because we are transitioning into the totem build now. You can see that we've grabbed Ancestral Bond as well as the nodes before it. We started grabbing more mana nodes. You can see some here, you can see some here and some here. These are going to facilitate us being able to use Mind Over Matter as well as helping us out with Agnostic. We grab some more life and we do grab Sanctum of Thought. I spoke about this earlier, but it's very important that if you're going the totem build with the chess piece, you need to make sure you have the Sanctum of Thought as well as the two Kikizaros. Without all of those, you're really going to be suffering. Not really much more. We start grabbing some spell crit here. This is a crit build. We grab the totem crit this spell crit, and this spell crit. That's pretty much it for this section. Just life, mana, spell crit, and then the Sanctum of Thought node here. Now, as we're transitioning into the end game portion of our build, we're gonna be swapping over to a Thread of Hope. Keep in mind that you don't need to do this. This isn't mandatory, but it does save you a ton of points because if you don't get this Thread of Hope, you really are gonna have to spend one, two, three, four points to be able to pick up Divine Wrath and to be able to pick up Divine Judgment. Divine Wrath is super important because this is going to allow you to finish converting your lightning damage, right? The way that our spell works, Divine Ire, is that it does 50% of conversion from physical to lightning. This plus the enchant on our gloves is going to finish out that conversion. So that means that we don't have to use physical to lightning. We don't have to use any of those other nodes. We get the full conversion without having to waste any more effort on it. It also lets us save a couple points here. We save this point in mana. We save these three points for Sanctum of Thought. And that allows us to anoint this node over here, which is super, super powerful. This is a crazy node. We get 5% increased spell damage per 5% chance to block attack damage. We've got like 75% block chance. So this is like 70 to 75% spell damage, 5% cast speed, and some, and some block. Other than that, we also finish out picking up these mana nodes. We grab this jewel slot right here, which gives us self-flagellation. You can also put that jewel down here, but Spire of Stone prevents our totems from being stunned. You don't have to use this, but it is pretty useful. This is the best slot for it out of the build that we have, because there are four strength nodes here. It gives our totems a little bit more life. We pretty much grab just some extra nodes around here. We can grab Unwavering Stance if you're having trouble with being stunned. I do suggest getting this around the end of the game. The last final little points on the level 100 tree, we finish out this mana right here, and we come up and grab Heart of Thunder just to top off our damage at the very end. Now keep in mind, with this spell tree, you can choose to forego some of the life to get more damage first, because this is level 100, right? So if you say you feel pretty tanky, you don't think that you need like all of these life nodes down here, you can forfeit grabbing those life nodes and just come up and grab Heart of Thunder first. Same thing with the mana, just go off of whatever, you know, makes you feel safe and makes you feel like you're doing enough damage. So let's talk about the Ascendancy next. Our Ascendancy is the Hierophant. This is the mana brand totem boy. 
as you know him, he's a pretty tanky boy. You might have remembered this guy from last league when people were doing um, Archmage builds with mana and all kinds of crazy stuff. What we're mainly focusing on is the totem aspect. Now we do grab Divine Guidance and we do grab Conviction of Power. We grab these first typically because we're not going to be swapping to totems until much later, but you can, if you really want to go immediately straight into totems, you can get Pursuit of Faith and you can get Ritual of Awakening first. First off, I went Divine Guidance. This is going to give us some damage taken before life, Transfiguration of Mind, which causes your increased mana percentage to give you a little bit of damage, as well as give us some more max mana. When we move on to our next ascendancy point, we're grabbing Conviction of Power. This gives us Endurance and Power Charge Generation. Whenever we summon a totem, we have a 50% chance to gain a Power Charge, and every time we gain a Power Charge, we have a 15% chance, or rather a 25% chance to gain an Endurance Charge. Also gives us some reduced elemental damage taken, gives us some damage penetration, just an overall good node. The next skill point that we're going to get is Pursuit of Faith. Gives us the extra one to max totems. This node allows us to start actually using totems once we're hitting endgame. That's one where you're kind of transitioning into it. Gives us a plus totem. It gives us some damage for when our totems have killed things, some cast speed, and some totem duration. And then the final and probably most powerful node is Ritual of Awakening. This gives us 3% more damage per summon totem. So remember, we can have five of our main totem, we can have two of our off totem. So that's seven times 3% more damage, 21% more damage. You also regenerate a percentage of your mana per second for each summon totem. So we're getting seven times 0.5, that's 3.5% of our mana. Gives us some totem placement speed. And also the most important thing of skills that would summon a totem, summon two totems instead. This works in conjunction with our chest piece, meaning that when we're cursing ourselves over and over and over again, as you're summoning those totems, it's gonna be shooting off two Divine Ires at a time because you're replacing two totems at a time. And also every single cast is cursing you twice because two totems are expiring. This is really super powerful. One of the biggest things for the build. You can't go without these totem nodes. You could maybe if you wanted to do this differently and you didn't wanna be as strong as what I say here, you could maybe go the Arcane Blessing thing. I don't think it's that great. Some people like it, but you would go Totems and Arcane Blessing. I don't think it's that good. Instead of getting Arcane Surge from here, you can just get Arcane Surge from your Arcane Cloak. It's it's much better this way. So just, just don't worry about these notes, they're bad. This node here is just for brands, and this node here, eh, it, it, it doesn't really do very much for us because we have a bunch of unreserved mana, but the problem is that 20% of maximum mana gained is energy shield. We can't have any more energy shield. It's gonna reduce the mana cost of our skills, which is bad for our arcane cloak. And it's also gonna make us do less mana reservation. That's fine. This node, I mean, it's okay, but it's not really the best. So that's the Ascendancy. Let's talk about skills. Our Divine Ire itself is a level 21 Divine Ire. Quality doesn't really matter that much on this skill. We use Elemental Focus, Increased Crit, Lightning Pin, Faster Casting, and Increased Crit Damage. Now, I want you to know that while I was leveling, it was better to not have Increased Crit Strikes or Increased Crit Damage and to be using um, Added Lightning Damage as well as Controlled Destruction. Towards the very end of the game, when I finally started to slot these crit nodes, which in the tree you'll see that I get them earlier because I figured out that they were better. You want to get these crit nodes a bit earlier, these ones and these ones and these ones. You get those a bit earlier because once you do have those crit nodes, increased crit strikes and increased crit damage is actually superior to added lightning damage as well as controlled destruction makes it work a lot better. Lightning Penetration just gives us a bunch of damage. Elemental Focus gives us a bunch of damage. You can swap Elemental Focus out for like Awakened added lightning damage if you really want to, if you wanna be able to shock. But unfortunately, because of the way that the totems work, the totems themselves, their hits aren't really huge. They're just numerous, right? You're hitting a bunch of times instead of one really hard time. So the shocks don't really do that much anyway. I don't worry about elemental focus. I just leave it in. The other thing that we use is Wave of Conviction. A Wave of Conviction, as I said, is using multiple totems. This makes it so that you have plus two to the maximum number of totems. As you saw in the previous um, example of a map, you could see that you can cast these and then just spam your Divine Iron totems. You don't have to worry about it. it gives us uh, the summon two totems at a time, which is pretty cool. It does make them do less damage, but that doesn't really matter. So Innervate is mainly for the supported skills have added lightning damage as well as the chance to shock. We are using this just as some way to maybe shock the enemies with uh, the Wave of Conviction totem. It also does give us the added lightning damage, which allows the totem to actually be doing the, um, the Wave of Conviction's lightning resistance lowering. So other than that, we link it with spell totem because we can't do damage if we're not doing totems. We use a clarity. This is just a max level clarity. It's the only aura that we 
use. You don't have to worry about any other auras. This is a mana defense build after all. We use an Immortal Call with Castle Damage Taken and Increased Duration. We have a ton of effective health pool. So you can see with the tree fully specced out, we have 5,000 life and almost 3,000 mana. So keep in mind that we have 40% mind over matter. That means you take your life pool and increase it by up to 40%. So 40% of 5,000 is 2,000. So effectively, when we get hit, if we got hit for 7,000, it would take that 2,000 from the mana pool as well before it took from the life pool and we would survive with like seven health. That's pretty cool and that's a really good amount of health, especially when we're regening constantly. We have the shield from Arcane Cloak. I mean, that's a pretty pretty respectable health pool. So you can boost this castle and damage taken all the way up to the top, it doesn't matter. We link that with increased duration to get our immortal call going. This gives us some defenses. It's pretty solid for the build, less physical damage, less elemental damage taken. And we do get endurance charges from our ascendancy. Remember that. So we actually do get the full less physical damage taken from this. Pretty solid. Now Arcane Cloak is the other big thing about this build. What Arcane Cloak does is it gives us a buff where we can take damage equal to the mana spent by the skill, and it also allows us to grant added lightning damage equal to 15% of the mana spent by the skill. So we're spending 65% of like 3,000-ish mana. That's a lot of damage and a lot of defenses. We also put second wind and increased duration to make it last longer and us be able to use it more often. And then this is where we grant our arcane surge. So this gives us 20% more spell damage, 19% increased cast speed, and a ton of mana regeneration. And it's all locked into our arcane cloak, which is on our left click. So it just casts constantly every time you're moving around. Pretty solid. Flame dash, I just have length with second wind. This is just in my offhand. There's nothing special about this. It's just our movement ability. Now I do use Vol Righteous Fire. This is the other spell in our offhand. This is mainly just for bosses. You don't use the normal righteous fire you can see if you look at our average hit damage here 500,000, you pop that on, you're doing 632,000. It's just something you pop right before you kill the boss. We do use a trigger wand, as I told you before. Whenever you use a skill, trigger a socketed spell when you use a skill. So in our wand, we do have Vol Cold Snap, Conductivity, and Tempest Shield. Cold Snap provides us frenzy charges. So any enemies that you kill in the little zone of Cold Snap provides you a frenzy charge. This is our source of frenzy charges. And Vol Cold Snap, whenever you pop Vol Cold Snap, will give you frenzy charges per second as they're standing in the zone. Just another useful thing that you can use on bosses to generate a few frenzy charges. Conductivity is our curse, and Tempest Shield gives us a little bit more block and spell block, just a useful thing to have. That's pretty much it for the skills. Let's talk about items. Now, as always, I have two sets of items here, okay? This is the budget gear. These are the items that I used. We killed Cirrus, Awakener 8. We killed Shaper like two times. We did a bunch of super high tier 16 maps, fully invested. Um, we did a lot of stuff on this build, and it was all pretty simple. This is the gear that I used to do it. Didn't cost me, I think the most expensive piece of gear was the six link chest piece. I think it was like an exalt and a half. Um, you don't need the six link, so you could just get a random five link soul mantle that'll probably be like 20 chaos or something. Super, super cheap. You don't need the crazy shield that I told you about. You could get enough gear in here for maybe 50 to 80 chaos and be able to do most of what I did, but the six link does help a decent amount with those really, really high end bosses if you don't want the fights to take forever. So let's go over our gear. Corpse Bite, this is our wand, right? Ideally, we would want this wand to be a plus one spell and a plus one lightning spell, but I, I just didn't have time to craft it. I, I really didn't want to spend that much time on the gear here. You're mainly looking for cast speed, you're looking for lightning spell skill gems, and you're looking for lightning damage to spells. Also, spell damage is really big here as well. Added lightning damage to spells is pretty good because it's going to be easier for you to get, but a huge spell damage roll would be even better. Our shield we talked about a bit before. You want that plus one to maximum number of summon totems. It's basically like a 25% more multiplier of damage here. It's a huge amount of damage, that plus one to max number of summon totems. That's the main thing you're looking for, as well as the block spell damage. With their helmet, life, resist, stats, nothing special. Soul Mantle, as I said before, this gives us some totem life. It gives us an additional number of totems. It also gives us our curse, self-curse generation engine. This allows us to curse ourselves a whole bunch of time. It gives us the seven link totem. You slot your gems into here. This is a huge source of damage for the bill. Like I said, I think when you have all of the curses on you, it's like 230% increased overall damage. That's massive, dude. Soul Mantle is pretty cheap. You don't have to worry too much about that. Our gloves, the only important thing about the gloves is that you get the percentage of physical damage converted to lightning. It's one divine to craft it. Other than that, just get some gloves with some life and some resistances. 
For our boots, I just pulled these out of my stash, I think. They're not even good. They're energy shield boots. Like, these, these, I had to craft life on them. I did most of the content of the game before I even realized I didn't have life on my boots. Um, resist, movement speed, life, get whatever you need, right? Our amulet. So, I crafted this amulet, and unfortunately, I crafted the wrong amulet. I should have crafted a plus lightning amulet, because I'm kind of stupid, because plus one physical skill gems doesn't help the rest of our stuff, like uh, Arcane Cloak and all of that. So a plus one to lightning gems would be ideal. Uh, and also, you'll see the top end amulet in the expensive item section. Two Kikizarus, just try to get good lightning resistance, some good mana regeneration rate. Our belt, a Stygian Vice with some life and some resistances. Life and mana is pretty much what you're looking for on your Abyssal Jewel. As for the flasks, Aziri's Promise is probably the only unique flask that is really worth it. You might be able to argue a case for um, gain chaos damage from Sin's Rebirth, but uh, it's not that much damage. And then there's also Wise Oak, but I'm not 100% certain that Wise Oak works. Aziri's Promise is the only one that I really cared about because we do both physical and elemental damage, so you gain both of those. This is actually a pretty good source of damage. We have a silver flask, a quick silver flask, a diamond flask, because the diamond flask does work for totems, as well as a enduring eternal mana flask. It's super important that you get an enduring eternal, right? You want this to be something that lasts as long as possible and gives you a ton of mana back. You're going to be having this up 24-7. We use a Thread of Hope. We talked about that earlier in the skill tree. We talked about Spire of Stone. We talked about Self-Flagellation. Now, if you want to know about Cluster Jewels, you can grab this Cluster Jewel slot here and put in some Lightning Cluster Gems. You can do that if you want to. It's a little bit more expensive. It's probably going to end up being more damage if you really min-max it out. It's not needed, though. I don't recommend Cluster Jewels anymore just because they're so expensive for what you get, but you can do whatever you like. Let's talk about the expensive items here. Now you can see the damage jumps. Let's move to the full skill tree here. The level 100 skill tree. With my items in the level 100 skill tree, we're doing 583,000 damage per cast of the totems. Keep in mind, it is the channeling average DPS, so 119,000, plus this releasing about every two seconds, right? So five totems times 583,000 divided by about half. So decent amount of damage. So you look at that damage, and then you look at the expensive options, and it goes up to 1.32 million per totem. These items are extremely expensive. I've had a couple people ask me about the expensive options. These are not meant to be achievable. The idea behind the expensive options are giving you goals of what to look for as like the ideal item, right? So like this wand, you're probably never going to be able to craft this wand unless you're a very, very high end super crafter, right? But the idea is, is you see what an ideal wand looks like, right? We got the base cast speed from the profane wand. We get the spell damage, the extra cast speed, the global crit strike multi. You can see that we go for plus two, so plus spell gems and plus lightning gems. You can see what kind of an ideal item is, right? So this gives us like three 371,000 average hit on our totems. On the shield, same thing as before, except we've got more life. We've got recover 5% of your mana when you block, as well as some global fizz damage. On the crown, the enchant that you would use if you were going to buy one, I actually think that this might be possible to get, is you would buy a arcane cloak grants life regeneration equal to 15% of the mana spent, or the other arcane cloak one that causes it to take more of your mana every time you cast it, and then just craft on top of this, right? You basically would just roll it until you get a bunch of mana mods, and then you would harvest craft life and some cold resist and some chaos resist, and you can go for the nearby enemies, have negative lightning resist if you want, but it's not super useful on a totem build because you would have to be standing next to them. Soul Mantle still, this is a plus two, plus one. Divine Ire doesn't really have very many tags on it that work with the corrupted ones, so we went with plus two, plus one insanely expensive but that's what it's meant to be that's what you're going for our gloves finish out our block chance with some chance to block attack damage some life some mana some resistances and the conversion our boots now you might be thinking oh well you should get tailwind and oh well you should get elusive well i mean elusive is not really useful to the build much at all tailwind you might be able to make an argument for that but you're gonna have to crit yourself so you're gonna have to attack with something that isn't a totem. So it's a little bit hard to be able to pull that off. Now, something interesting though, is that there is a enchant that you can get on this, the 120% increased critical strike chance if you haven't crit recently. If you're using only totems, you never crit. So this is just 120% increased critical strike chance for your totems, just always. That's pretty good. Life, resist, movement speed, gain 8% of physical damage, extra lightning damage, pretty solid. Now this is like the ideal necklace, right? You've got the allocates arcane swiftness, you've got the 20% augmented, it's got plus one 
intelligence, plus one lightning, a bunch of life, a bunch of crit and crit multi, and cast speed. Those are the things that you're looking for in this build. It wouldn't be too hard to craft just the intelligence and the lightning, and then just slot some life and maybe slot some crit on it. But that's the idea. You can go for some cast speed corrupted Kikizaros if you really want to break the bank. And then the belt is just life, mana resistances, and some mana recovery rate. Mana recovery rate's actually insanely strong. So if you can get these, it would be a huge boost to your regeneration. Other than that, there's not much to talk about. You could get a um, bottled faith if you really wanted to go all in on this build, but I, I don't think that you would need it. But this is just an idea for some insanely expensive stuff. So let's talk about the configuration. I always kind of talk about this a little bit just so that people know why I choose the things that I do because I don't want you thinking that I'm just like buffing the numbers of this build without having any idea as to why it's actually working that way, right? Going down the list, we are not always on full life. This is going to demonstrate to you how much the life regen is, right? So you can see here we have about 1300 life regen. Normally our life regen is about 600 when we are on full life and we have a thousand mana regen per second. But when that agnostic kicks in, it buffs up our life regen up to double, basically. We gain power charges from our ascendancy. I didn't click frenzy charges because they're not going to be consistent on bosses. But honestly, you can have frenzy charges up pretty much constantly because of cold snap and vol cold snap. But we didn't put that into the calculations just because it's not all the time. Endurance charges we also get from our ascendancy. Um, onslaught we get from the flask, so we don't have to worry about clicking this. Uh, we don't have any of these buffs. We do pretty much always have a flask active and we always do have a totem summoned. We're summoning totems constantly, so we will have them down. Our maximum number of totems is seven. Now the normal max is, it's gonna think is five, but we do have two totem spells that we can cast at any given time. So it is actually seven. Now, number of mana spent recently is 1500. This is the amount of mana that you're going to be spending on each arcane cloak, roughly. It might be a little bit more than this actually, but that's the number that I put in just to kind of be safe. We're pretty much always going to be blocking recently and we're always going to be hit recently. This is just damage that we're gonna take. Wave of Conviction is doing lightning exposure. We also do have all of our curses on us here, as you can see. You get these from your chest piece. So you're going to be constantly self-cursing. There's not really a ton that we have active here. Not anything here really. Crit Lucky is from our flask. Um, we might be able to shock from our one ability, but I don't even know how much it would be, like maybe five at most. I just don't worry about it. Um, and this is on Cirrus as well as Awakener level eight. So you can see damage is pretty solid. And that's pretty much going to be it for the path of building. If I missed anything, let me know in the comments and I'll add it into the notes and such later. So let me know if you have any ideas. That's gonna be it guys. Totems, who would have thought? Most fun build of the league. I, I honestly think it might be. So remember, if you like this video, give it a like to help more people see it. And also consider subscribing for more content similar to this. And stay safe out there in class. And we'll see you guys in the next video.